In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would, uh, through your Spirit, through the uncreated and, and created Immaculate Conceptions, <clears throat> illumine our minds uh, through the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to understand the great theological insights of St. Maximilian Kolbe as uh, synthesized and presented by your great servant, uh, Father Peter Damien Filner. Uh, St. Bonaventure, pray for us. St. Francis, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Pray for us. Uh, blessed John Duns Scotus, pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to begin sharing screen, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and we may have to go back and forth with some of this, um, but I hope it will be okay. All right, share, and then from the beginning. Okay, well, this week we're going to <clears throat> excuse me, begin looking at uh, the theologian of Auschwitz proper. Uh, Father Peter is the author, Father Peter Damien Fellner is the author, and the main title is The Theologian of Auschwitz, and the subtitle is St. Maximilian Kolbe on the Immaculate Conception in the Life of the Church. And what we first want to do, after presenting a brief outline of the way this course, I, this lesson, excuse me, I hope will go, is to look at the title and unpack that title a bit. Okay, so in this second lesson, first we want to look at the uh, nature of theology, uh, its sources and method, where we go to look for theological information, and then how do we pursue th theology? And we will argue for a, a specific point of departure and methodology that, ten that seems to correspond quite closely to the patristic and biblical model uh, represented especially in figures like St. Irenaeus, but also figures like St. Athanasius of Alexandria, St. Ambrose of M Milan and other figures. And we'll take a look at some of their texts. Then the next aspect, I hope to uh, just briefly look at the title itself. What was Father Peter getting at when he entitled the book, Theologian of Auschwitz? And then the subtitle having to do with St. Maximilian Kolbe on the Immaculate Conception in the life of the church. There are several important themes that can be unpacked in this title. And we will see that the book itself really, uh, or the title rather, really encapsulates the method and content of the book. And then we want to, after we unpack the title, uh, give the overview. Uh, Father Peter was a great student of St. Bonaventure, and St. Bonaventure was one who would exploit and manifest uh, meaning through the very structure, meaning how he put the book together, how the parts fit together from beginning through the middle to the end. And Father Peter in this book does that very carefully through his structure He's, he structures the book in such a manner that the meaning is very clear, and it actually follows the methodology that we will outline in the first part of this lesson. And then finally, if we have time, I hope to look at some of the terms that we find in the glossary. But uh, the glossary itself will be very important for uh, reading and study of the book as we go through the book. Certain terms will come up uh, continuously, and so we can return again and again to the glossary. So in the first place, we have to ask then, what is theology? <clears throat> well, theology, according to St. Bonaventure, in the first part of the Breviloquium and in other places, theology begins where philosophy ends. So a philosophy is divided up into basically areas of natural the natural world, natural philosophy, or what they called uh, physics, um, ethics, anthropology, and metaphysics. And there's a kind of hierarchical or uh, organization in philosophy wherein metaphysics, which studies the issue of being, that which is, or as Bonaventure would say, that which is in flight from non-being or nothing, or Blessed Duns Scotus would say, that to which reality, meaning the, the convergence, the real existence of what something is, essence, and that it is, that it actually exists, existence is not contrary or repugnant. If, if metaphysics studies being as such, then metaphysics term, or the term of metaphysics, is a realization of perfect being, or as 
Bonaventure would say, that being which is in full flight from nothing, that being which has nothing of nothing. And if you state that in a positive way, that being which is maximally or absolutely or in the highest manner, perfect. That being which lacks nothing of any characteristic or quality that would be understood to be essential to being in its fullest reality in kind and its fullest reality in existence. And so Scotus would simply call this perfect being. Perfect being will have every perfection, which is not contrary to um, its own existence, such as a limited perfection like matter <clears throat> or a limited mode of perfection, such as we might find in terms of a created person having finite wisdom or finite knowledge or finite justice. Perfect being is that which being is that being which has the absolute maximal or infinite perfection of any given perfection, as well as in itself being absolutely perfect or infinitely perfect. And so Scotus would just simply say, this being is infinite being, and this being is identical in terms of our philosophical understanding to first being first being, which is the cause and explanation of all other beings and the end of all other beings. This is God. So philosophy ends in metaphysics and metaphysics itself ends in a knowledge of perfect being. Well, theology takes over from metaphysics and begins where philosophy ends. That, that is with perfect or infinite being as such. And ultimately, and primarily what we find is that perfect or infinite being is not just being in a generic sense, not just some absolute instantiation or reality of perfection, but the very perfection itself is Trinitarian. And that Trinitarian perfection that the divine being is, is sourced or rooted in the Father. So <clears throat> what we ultimately end up with is then theology is ultimately about who the Father is and who the Father is in terms of his generation of the Son and his spiration through the Son of the Holy Spirit. So theology is ultimately about Trinity, ad intra, and ad extra. It's about the missions, the Father sending the Son and sending the Spirit into the world in order to accomplish his purpose for that world, which we will discover is that the mission of the Son sent into creation and in establishing and perfecting the economy of salvation and redemption is for the son to take on flesh in order that the son can create a bride, build up a bride, the church, in this one flesh unity that is imaged in the first few chapters of Genesis in the primordial marriage. That model then becomes the model for the mission of the son to take on a bride and in taking on a bride to give his spirit to that bride, which is the church, and thereby finding the perfect culmination or perfection of the mission of the Spirit. The Spirit, who is the Spirit sent from the Father, the Spirit that comes from the Son, or the Spirit of the Father and or through the Son in building up the church or the bride of Christ in that one flesh unity. Uh, so <clears throat> that's a bit of a preview, but theology, in a sense, is, is a word about God. That is, Theology is the study of God. It, it, it's made up of uh, two Greek words, theos and logos. And when you put them together, uh, theos meaning God or divinity and logos meaning word or reason or rationality, we then come to see that theology is simply the reasoning or the speaking about God. And there are several types of theology, but the, the important thing to remember is that theology is distinct from philosophy in in a couple of senses if philosophy terminates in a knowledge of god and philosophy reasons on the basis of what is uh, apprehensible apart from supernatural revelation then we then we can distinguish there is there is a theological discourse that is according to nature that is what we can know about the perfections of god through realities that are that don't require or don't entail a special revelation. But then there's another mode of theology, revealed theology, or what Duns Scotus calls our theology, our theology that's revealed by and for a specific purpose. And this is what theology is in the proper sense, is theology that is 
reasoning about what God has manifested in and through his son. And so the, the fundamental insight is that if theology ultimately is about God and theology is about proper in itself, the Trinity, namely the, the processions and circumincessant, the inexistence, the relation between the three persons of the Trinity in God, if theology is properly about the Trinity, theology is also about the missions. And it's through the missions of the Son and the Spirit at extra, namely with respect to creation and its recreation through the, the primordial um, existence or predestination of Christ and Mary or Christ through Mary and in creation as such, and then creation as such being reheaded and reordered and restructured uh, in order that through Christ and in and with the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, there will be a return to the Father, then theology ad extra, what we call theology in the economy, or Scotus would call the theology of the contingent, as opposed to the necessary, which is God in himself, the Trinity. This theology has to be manifested and taught. We have one teacher who is Christ, as Bonaventure famously put in one of his sermons. Um, <clears throat> John 118 really gives a key indication of this understanding of theology, and I'll just read it. If you bear with me for a second. After a lengthy prologue in which, which we understand and we're, we're given insight into the identity of Jesus Christ, who in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then he, be, he tabernacled, or be, he became flesh. That, that is, he took on, namely, the Christ, that predestined um, man-god or god-man took on flesh, meaning our fallen mode of existence insofar as Christ with, who had no sin and had perfect knowledge of his personal identity as the son of the father and perfect knowledge of his mission in his incarnation. He took on the, the conditions of fallen humanity. He took on flesh and he, he dwelt among his people for the sake of building up in his flesh that unity with his bride. <clears throat> and then, um, but who is this? Who is this Christ? And who is the Father? Well, Christ reveals the Father. And this is really kind of a charter of our uh, theology is that no, reading John 1 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And so theology is based on the declaration of the Son who is in the bosom of the Father, such that we might know the will of of the Father. And so theology is speaking about what the Father has revealed and manifested through Christ and the gift of faith, the faith that is infused and, and, and activated through the Spirit in the context of the church. So theology is a word about what Christ the teacher has taught us. A theology is a word that is to help us to shape our minds and our wills and our hearts so that we can become like Christ in following his teaching through the power of the Holy Spirit. What we find, though, is that if Christ is the one teacher, well, Mary also has this magisterial role. And this is a key theme of Fellner's uh, Mary in Metaphysics, which will be um, volume one of his collected essays. And so without going in to too much of, of the details, because this will be fleshed out in the book, it's important to note that Christ and Mary, through Mary's unique relationship as, in some sense, coming before Christ and being the primary term of what you might say the creator spirit with respect to both the creation itself in anticipation of Christ and the incarnation, but also the, the spirit of Israel, the perfection of daughter Zion, with respect to the mission of the people of Israel at, as such to bring forth the eternal king who is the Davidic uh, Messiah, Mary has this, this unique relationship. So on the one hand, then, you might say she is, she is typified and she's the antitype of the virgin earth metaphor, the unfallen earth. She is that first term of the spirit bringing to perfection what creation was meant to do or meant to... Um, assent to, and that is Mary's fiat, let it be done according to my, according to thy word. <clears throat> so she is in a sense prior to Christ, and the role of Mary in being prior to Christ is to accept in faith the promise of the Messiah, 
in a very personal way. This, this promised Messiah is going to be brought forth from her own substance in a virginal mode through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Mary is the first recipient of the perfect gospel sent by the angel Gabriel. Mary is the one who first accepted the word of truth. Remember, Christ says that, you know, when they say, behold, your mother and your brothers, and he says, who is my mother and my brother? Um, but those who hear the word of God and keep it. Well, Mary was that first one who heard the word of God and in faith believed that God, that nothing was impossible with God and that something wonderful, namely the, the angel of great counsel, that, that, that man, that Messiah, that king, kingly figure prophesied in Isaiah would be brought forth through her uniquely. And so in this then, Mary is the culmination of creation and the old covenant up to the point of the incarnation. And so she is the, she is the new Eve from which or out of which the new Adam, Christ, is, is, is brought forth. But on the other hand, she has a role related directly to Christ and his ministry. So if she is the new Eve and, and, and is some way prior, and the Holy Spirit is operating through her in a manner prior to the incarnation, but of course, for the sake of the incarnation, <clears throat> she is the, that immaculate conception for the sake of the incarnation, namely through the divine maternity. She also, in virtue of that divine maternity and bringing forth the Son and becoming a disciple of the Son and following his teaching, becomes the first member or most perfect member because she is both immaculate and she's the divine mother, she becomes the first member or bride of Christ, the mystical bride of Christ in his body. And so she's not just the virgin earth, she also is the new Eve. And she takes her place as immaculate conception and as the uh, mother of the king typified in the relationship between Solomon and Bathsheba, um, she takes her place alongside Christ, the, the prophet, the priest, and the king in roles that are befitting to her unique place in the body, and she then thereby becomes the profile of the church. She becomes the image of the bride, but the image of the bride already perfected and in anticipation of the perfection that the church will take on universally and corporately uh, in the eschaton. And so she takes on, if Christ has a prophetic or magisterial role, Christ is our one teacher, then Mary also has a magisterial role in her own way. And what you find then is that what Father Peter does in his Mary metaphysics is he applies the tradition of the church, especially through the witness of St. Francis, but as St. Francis transpo is transposed into a theological key by St. Bonaventure. So if Francis had the insight into rebuilding the church and a radical devotion, a devotion to the point of stigmatization, uh, miraculous stigmatization to Christ, the, 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 the Eucharistic Lord, for the purposes of rebuilding his temple, on the one hand, he also had an absolute devotion to Our Lady, as really the one who gave him insight into the mission and cause of the order, which is the cause of rebuilding the church in the image and into the image of what she already is eschatologically in Mary as assumed by an application and insight into Mary's unique relation to the Holy Spirit as the spouse of the Spirit and as the mother of the church. The spouse of the Spirit being really an indication of who Mary is in her person as revealed and as so understood by uh, St. Maximilian through the apparitions of Our Lady at Lourdes to St. Bernadette, that I am the Immaculate Conception. Well, Mary is in a unique relation as Immaculate Conception in a metaphorical understanding that she is thereby espoused to the Holy Spirit in a unique way, a unique way, however, metaphorically understood, um, such that she is the unique instrument of the Holy Spirit. And, and Bonaventure really is um, the, the point of departure for this insight, this insight into the relationship between Christ and Mary as magister and magistra uh, to theologians, to the apostles, and to the entire church. So Bonaventure emphasizes this. Christ is the one teacher of all because Christ is the one who declares the Father to all through his incarnation. This is why he came to do the will of the Father. My, my meat or my food, Christ says, is to do the will of the Father. But Bonaventure also articulates then there's this ecclesiological aspect too, which is Marian, because Mary is the profile and first witness and first disciple 
of Christ, the one teacher of all. And she takes on this maternal uh, mediatory aspect as teacher and as queen in relation to the church, bringing the church to the fullness of its perfection as an immaculate spotless bride. And Bonaventure's uh, doctrine on these points are, are very carefully worked out and systematically worked out in his sermons on Mary. And you find a kind of um, capstone or culmination or relative perfection of Bonaventure's understanding of the church in relation to Christ its head and in relation to Mary, its mother, the mother of the head and the body, in his collations on the six days of creation, which he takes, or they're also called reflections or meditations on the church. So the collations on the six days, even though incomplete, they are Bonaventure's arguing, presenting types in the very six days of creation of the entire order of history going forward from beginning namely creation through the middle Christ to the consummation of creation in the perfection of the one flesh union of Christ and his church and Christ's presentation of the church as an everlasting kingdom to the Father when all enemies have been put under, under the dominion of Christ and brought into subjection. So then... If Christ is the teacher of theology, what are we? What kind of theology are we doing? We're doing um, or discussing in terms of what um, Father Peter's mission was in in writing was uh, dogmatic theology. Dogmatic theology is taking the proclamation or authoritative, infallible teaching of the Church and reflecting upon it, systematizing it, in order that it can be proclaimed and practiced. So dogma is not uh, speculation in the sense that I'm trying to come up with premises or I'm forming hypotheses and testing them and seeing if they work out and, or, and, or are coherent and then forming general theses on the basis of these hypotheses and premises. Um, no, what dogma is, is the proclamation, authoritative proclamation of what is to be believed on the basis of divine authority. So it is, it is church teaching in the authoritative and binding way on the basis of what Christ has revealed directly or manifested of the will of the Father about himself, about the church, about uh, human history, what Christ has revealed directly or what Christ has given to his apostles or and then their successors to teach authoritatively in his name, in Christ's name, who came and taught authoritatively in the name of the Father through the um, illuminating power and clarity of the Holy Spirit. So, so dogma, it does not equal simply preaching, although preaching is based in dogma. Dogma is, according to St. Basil, dogma and proclamation are two distinct things doctrine or dogma we profess without argument we accept it on divine authority but our teaching we make known to all the world so it's what dogma is what we profess and so dogma is the subject of theologians in the church who accept the faith who accept the authority of christ and then teaching what the doctrine is expressed this is where preaching comes in so the doctrine is professed without argument and then what preaching professes and teaching professes that's what's made known to the world so dogma does not simply equal preaching although preaching has to be rooted in and be in conformity with what is professed without argument secondly dogma is not simply apologetics referring to dogma or doctrine which is professed on the basis of christ's authority saint gregory of nyssa writes quote let us to reason within our own border. So apologetics is giving an answer or a response for why something is believed. But it is not what is believed in itself. It's a defense of what is believed. It's a defense to build up the faith of believers, but it's also a, fence, a defense to give answers to those who would object or even answers to inquirers. And so dogma has a, a certain provenance or home within the church. Not, not as preaching and not as apologetics. Dogma is, in a sense, dogmatic theology, I should say, is, in a sense, the discipline which tries to deepen 
and apply and extend what the church professes. <clears throat> so to sum up then, dogmatic theology, what is it? This is what Father Peter is working on here. Um, dogma is for the believing community of the faithful. Uh, it is meant to be pursued in the life of the church, the life of the church translating the teaching or the doctrine declared by Christ with, um, with, with, with intellectual, philosophical, uh, and all the other tools of reason in order to make that teaching transparent and accessible to the believers. So it is first authoritative, authoritative teaching what is to be believed. And this authoritative teaching that is to be believed is realized and actuated and, in fact, presupposes the sacramental economy of the church already existing. So Christ established his church in order to be the locus where his teaching, his doctrine is accepted in faith and then brought to the world, both to believers and unbelievers, but within a context of this sacramental unity between, between Christ the head, who reigns eucharistically, in the very sacraments, especially, obviously, the sacrament of Holy Communion through the, the actions of the, the Mass or Divine Liturgy. He reigns eucharistically, but he reigns eucharistically in its infallible effect, precisely in order to establish and maintain that one flesh unity with his bride. So this is what we speak of when we speak of the whole Christ, Christ the head and members. So Christ the head and members established the church at Last Supper and the cross. And he, his authority was recognized in his and, and, and ratified in his resurrection and ascension. The church was born, in a sense, on the cross with the statement of Christ that it is finished and the, the typological flowing out of blood and water from the side of Christ symbolizing the sacraments. The church is born at the cross, but the church is manifested as distinct as bride in Acts chapter 2 and the, 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 the Feast of Pentecost, that first Pentecost where the Holy Spirit comes upon the community of believers, the apostles and disciples of Christ around Our Lady, giving them with the, both the power of the Spirit to proclaim and to pursue and to uphold the mission that Christ gives his body through his Spirit with respect to the world. And so the, the, the church was born at Calvary, but the church was distinguished at Pentecost. And it's in this distinguished nature that the, the church as continuing to recognize the Eucharistic reign of Christ through sacramental worship, and then go out and live and incorporate this uh, reign of Christ in their bodies and in their social and political and economic activities, both within the church and outside of the church. This is where the, the sacramental economy comes into and is the locus or nexus for the authoritative teaching of the church to be believed. It's already presupposing and already for the sake of that one flesh union between Christ and his church. And hence, if this is the context for dogmatic theology, as I've already stated, it's properly pursued by believing theologians. Now, it is the case that uh, an atheist could be a theologian, but that but that wouldn't be theology in its proper location, or in a or theology that would be fruitful for the salvation of souls. It would rather be theology pursued in a secondhand way that is based upon merely um, human testimony. You know, the atheist who per, who was a theologian would simply be parroting what he's heard from other people. Whereas the believing theologian is one who's situated, whose life is, in, is, is marked and changed by, that, by his or her incorporation and living within the communion that Christ established to be his body, the church, his kingdom, uh, his kingdom on earth, in communion with not just all other believers, but communion with believers already gloriously uh, triumphant in heaven. So if dogma is, is meant to be within and pursued by believers in the church, then dogma is bound up in the life of the historic uh, 
yet transcendent life of the church, historic because Christ truly is reigning sacramentally in the church. He is substantially and personally um, present in the church's Eucharistic worship in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Yet, because he is in the Eucharist in a sacramental substantial mode rather than a natural mode as he was in his time of pilgrimage, there is a transcendence. Christ has ascended to the Father. He can no longer die. He can no longer suffer. He can't be crucified again on the one hand, so he's not subject to the vicissitudes of history, yet he can reign in a historical manner because that transcendent life is brought directly into the life of the church through her Eucharistic worship. And so the, the, the reality of dogma posits then historical development, because as uh, I noted in the last lecture, I think, the, uh, perhaps I didn't, the, the statement of Bonaventure that the work of Christ always goes forward um, is, is very important. The work of Christ never goes backward. There's going to be a deepening, um, both in terms of its the intellectual component, a deepening reflection and understanding of what Christ objectively taught and gave to his apostles and the apostles and, the, and his apostles and their successors continue to carry out in the Eucharistic life of the church in terms of teaching and in terms of administering sacraments. So there's a historical development, but an essential continuity. Why? Well, because it's what Christ declared of the Father that's at issue. And it's the same Christ who declared the will of the Father in his earthly ministry, in his incarnation. That same Christ continues to reign historically, yet now ascended, yet now transcendent in the sacraments. And so there's going to be a historical development as well as an, an essential continuity. So you have to be able to apply a method of interpretation that presupposes and accepts um, the, the fundamental historical transcendental and transcendent realities of the church, that simultaneity of both realities, yet within a, an essential continuity because it's the same Christ reigning. And so the conclusion here then is that dogmatic theology is not just about ideas. It's not primarily about ideas. Reality is ultimately about persons. It's ultimately about real things that exist. So what dogmatic the theology really is about is about the persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the persons of Jesus and Mary. They're persons with agency. They're persons with wills. And their persons act in and through the sacramental economy of the one bride. And so dogmatic theology isn't about ideas. It's about understanding who these people are such that we can conform our wills to their will and become like them and enter into communion with them through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's ultimately then about persons, the sacramental economy, and then how relating and speaking about these sacred persons inform and inspire our witness and deepen our communion, both with each other, but more importantly, with the persons of the Trinity, so that all of us can be brought into a relationship, a filial adoptive relationship to the father, but also an adoptive relationship to the mother um, through being brought to Christian maturity, this perfection of charity. Um, a, a, beautiful, a beautiful statement that's quoted in the catechism is from Pope Leo the Great, Pope Leo the First, wherein he writes, and this is, this is something that has to be remembered and applied, because this is, what, um, this is what explains, perhaps even we might say, it's a primary analogate of being, is the Eucharistic mode of being that Christ is now in heaven and on our altars in a personal and transcendent yet historical manner. Pope Leo the, the first says, that which was visible in our Redeemer or Savior, has now passed over into the sacraments. So what Christ was in his earthly mission, in establishing the church, in recruiting disciples, in converting them, in establishing a sacramental economy and declaring who the Father is because he always was in the bosom of the Father, this has now passed over into sacraments. And so in this understanding of dogma, Dogma is bound up and inseparable from the concrete historical life of the church, the church that is always united to its head as bride, and always perfectly united to its head as bride, precisely because 
of who Mary is as Immaculate Conception and Divine Mother, perfect witness of the teachings of Christ and perfect disciple of the teachings of Christ, who is already from the moment of her conception and then continuously perfected perfectly unity with the will of the Spirit to such a degree that she also was assumed after her repose into heaven and bodily reigns at the right hand of our Lord, who is at the right hand of the Father, instantiating, realizing, manifesting, and already the, the, the perfection of what the church is called to be. And so this, this is a very important factor. The church is always united to its head. And we know this with certainty of faith because Our Lady is always perfectly united to the head. And so there's this perfect mystical one flesh union between Christ and his bride that is everlasting and unbreakable. So if, if, if um, dogmatic theology has to do with the life of the church and that which deepening reflection upon that which we accept by authority, uh, positive theology is more, uh, how do we, where do we go to look for the data of, of dogmatic theology. We've already mentioned part of it, um, but fundamental theology as opposed to dogmatic, dogmatically, dogmatic theology, excuse me, is primarily the gathering and collection of what, what are or what is the data of revelation. So if dogmatic theology is an internal systematic reflection on what revelation is, fundamental theology tries to establish and organize what that revelation is, the contents, the material contents of that revelation. And so the, the, <clears throat> the notion or the project of fundamental theology or positive theology as opposed to dogmatic theology is to identify and organize the sources of theology and thereby help to establish what is the material content of revelation. And of course, this requires witnesses. And so dogmatic theology is, in a sense, higher than, in terms of dignity, than positive theology. But nevertheless, it still requires um, positive theology, just as uh, contemplation certainly is higher. Loving contemplation of God is higher than um, doing sums of arithmetic, or more important, or, or less importantly, excuse me, engaging in some athletic feat, feat like jogging. Nevertheless, each one of these functions, given who we are in this uh, time-space continuum, this composite of body-soul, we require nutrition. And so for any of these aspects, uh, nutrition is required in order to carry out these various functions. So if we don't have food, if we're starved, uh, we won't be able to contemplate unless we presume that there's going to be a super erogatory gift of grace. And of course that, ha that happens, but that happens solely on the initiative of God himself. We can't presuppose this. And in the life of the church, positive theology like nutrition is for the service of dogmatic theology. Even though dogmatic, dogmatic theology may be higher in dignity, nevertheless, uh, dogmatic theology requires positive theology in order to know what to reflect upon in faith, in the context of the Eucharistic worship and reign of Christ and Mary in the church. Uh, and another aspect of, po of, 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 dogma of uh, positive theology is apologetics. Uh, it can be considered an aspect of fundamental theology, but it's where, uh, where fundamental theology is turned inward, trying to establish what we're to believe. Dogma uh, apologetics is in a sense, focused outward. It's giving an answer. We've already touched upon this. And why, why is this so important to get understanding of where we're coming from? It's because Maximus, uh, St. Maximilian's theology is criticized often for an, an insufficient doctrinal foundation and ecclesial foundation. And so what we're trying to do here is spell out how these different modes of theology function and are to be understood in relation to uh, what Father Peter has done with the thought and work of St. Maximilian on the one hand, but also to give an answer to why, if we have 
the understanding, the, the traditional classical understanding of what theology is, dogmatic theology in relation to the life of the church and the sanctification of the intellect. Um, this is a propedeutic to entering into the work of St. Maximilian and its clarification and amplification and extension by Father Peter in the Theologian of Auschwitz. And so that's just, uh, if I didn't make that clear at the beginning, this is, what's, this is what we're doing. <clears throat> so dogmatics, if we're talking about dogmatics, we have certain a prioris. Uh, we must assume that its subject exists. We can't, we can't bootstrap ourselves into a recognition or a creation of what dogmatic theology is. Remember, uh, dogmatic theology is based upon what is accepted on the basis of authority. And the authority is the one who is of the one who declares the father because he is the son who is in the bosom of the Father. Again, John 1, 1 through 18. No scientist, by extension, we must, so, that, so therefore we must assume that the subject of dogmatic theology exists. In any discipline, no discipline, uh, no, no practitioner of that discipline proves or establish, establishes the existence or, of, or reality of his or her subject of inquiry. So we must presuppose that dogmatic theology exists. And then the next question is, what is dogmatic theology's scope and purpose? So here we get to the interplay between positive theology and the witnesses of tradition, what we call the monuments of tradition, on the one hand, and how a dogmatic theologian, such as Father Peter, interacts with these sources. So the, the positive theologians gather and organize the sources, and we'll, we'll touch upon We'll, we'll explain what these sources are in some of the next slides. Um, the dogmatic theolog theologian interacts with these sources that are given by positive theology. But how does he interact? So how does, how does, how does a dogmatic theologian approach a text of, say, St. Augustine or uh, a text of scripture? How does, how does he know? What's the method? So basically then, even though dogmatic theology is based upon what is accepted on the authority of Christ, there is a methodology of interaction of the dogmatic theologian with those very sources. So is there such a method in the light of a certain but very real way uh, series or reality of doctrinal developments, as well as changing historical and cultural con uh, contexts? I think a key point here is that although there is objective witnesses in history, monuments of tradition, uh, church teaching, scripture, liturgy, uh, the church fathers, the church, the doctors of the church, um, all of these are already presupposing the subject or subjective, meaning the individual reality of the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ who's been given the teaching of Christ. So any one of these authoritative teachers in the church will have already derived their authority and then carried out their reflections in faith on the basis of authority, namely the authority of Christ and that authority that he extended to his successors, the apostles and their successors, the bishops, the bishops in communion with the successor of St. Peter. So there's an interesting interplay, there's objective historical reality, there's monuments of tradition, but each monument of tradition already is presupposing the authoritative teaching of Christ and his successors and their successors. So the principle of dogmatic theology is that we accept these truths and even their later dogmatic development and articulations on the very authority of Christ. So there must be a magisterium, a magisterium that extends and applies the unique magisterium of Christ and the mediatory magisterium of Our Lady. And so ultimately Christian theology is based upon a recognition of authority, even though it uses and interacts with uh, historical and philosophical resources. That's the word I was looking for. <clears throat> so what is dogmatic theology? Why is it distinct? Well, if, if fundamental theology and philosophy in, in a certain degree um, and apologetics is intellectus quer querens fidem or understanding seeking faith, dogmatic theology, again, presupposing and accepting the authority of Christ is faith seeking understanding. So dogmatic theology is already accepting of the declaration of the Father by our Lord and everything that that entails, both in terms of teaching as well as in terms of life, namely the, the, the sacramental reality of the church. This is faith, the posture of faith, the acceptance 
of what God has taught us through the gift of the Holy Spirit, the infused gift of faith, seeking greater understanding and penetration of these mysteries so that ultimately we can know God better, but know God better in order to what? To praise him, to worship him, and to enter ever more deeply into union with him and in conformity to Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is dogma is a question. How and why is it distinct from other instances of theological teaching and reflection? So in the first place, it has a certain focus, but it also has uh, a, an eye towards advance. So there's this aspect of accepting the authoritative teaching of Christ and his successors. That's the basis in faith. But there's also an aspect of deepening and clarifying the teaching of Christ, which was passed down through the teaching of the church. And this has a positive and negative aspect. Negatively, it has to do with the correction and exclusion of heresy. For example, uh, the Council of Ephesus 431 was convened in large part to respond to uh, Nestorius' claim that Mary was not Theotokos. She was not the mother of God, the God-bearer. He said, rather, she was Christotokos, which um, obviously derives from certain points of of, of nonconformity in his understanding of Christology, which tended to divide the union between humanity and divinity in the one person of Christ into two personalities, two coordinated, but not essentially necessarily or substantially united realities, namely um, divinity and unity, substantially united in the person of the word, the divine person of the word, he tended to see them more as a coordination, or at least his explanations lended itself to that misunderstanding, such that you arrive at an implicit denial of the truth of the incarnation, the reality spoken of in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, that it, it tends to deny that, and it tends to deny it because when he says Mary is not Theotokos, but rather Christotokos, that means that Mary only gave birth to the humanity of Christ. She did not give birth to the whole person. Thus, you have a problem of the unity of the person and the reality of the incarnation. So dogmatic theology then negatively corrects and excludes heresies. Heresies, why? With Theotokos. If you deny Theotokos, <clears throat> you deny that Christ is in the flesh. And John, in his uh, epistles, says that this is the sin of an Antichrist. And so clearly, the church is clarifying this. It's a, it's a contested term, a contested term that has to do with Our Lady as Mother of God. But precisely in how this was understood and formulated, it bore directly upon who Christ was, the reality of the incarnation, and ultimately on who Christ was in his relation of sonship to the Father, um, and thus his eternal divinity. So that's a negative aspect. And this is something that happens throughout the history of the church. Oops, let's go back. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, there's a positive. that This is, this is pointing to a deepening uh, clarification. So, for example, the, the <clears throat> of what the church has already believed. So, for example, the church has always believed that Christ was divine. This is implied in its worship. Uh, the, the Hebrew religion and the early Christian religion never uh, affirmed that one could give worship worship that praise and glory and honor which is due to God alone as the very source of all being and our being, um, that can never be given to some something, either personal or um, merely essential, some agent that is not divine. And so the church has always believed this and affirmed this as given witness to in its earliest liturgical um, rites. Christ was always worshiped. And if he was worshiped, Christ must have been divine, uh, but it, there was there was difficulty in understanding. Well, if how can how can God be one, and yet admit of an incarnation? That seems to say, well, there are two, and also if there's an incarnation, that one or two, which we say is God or our God, uh, must have undergone change. And this is what uh, the Arian and the the derivations, the followers of Arius um, and the Arian heretics articulated something uh, basically 
uh, manifesting these fundamental misunderstandings regarding the unity of, 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 of God and the possibility for incarnation without undergoing change. Uh, Arius was a very good philosopher and says, this, does, this doesn't make sense. Well, St. Athanasius the Great, using biblical language and the clear articulation of the divine prerogatives and divine identity, again, going back to John chapter one, of who Jesus is, says, no, Jesus and the scripture manifests and declares that Jesus is divine. And our church's worship bears this out in application and implication of, 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 of this fundamental datum of Christian faith, and we must adhere to this, but we also must then clarify the language and um, achieve a, a clearer and more succinct and universalizable creedal declaration of what this teaching is, and this is what we find in Nicaea when we, we, we discover that the Son is of one Usia, homo usias, one essence or being with the Father. And then you have developing out of this is you have a distinction then between usia, that which is common in the one God, and person. And so this gets developed in subsequent councils. But uh, the point is, is to, to provide two instances of kinds of deepening and clarification that dogmatic theology in its ultimate application in authoritative teaching either by the Pope or by uh, Pope and Council, this is what dogmatic theology is doing. So there is an aspect then of a foundation, that which Christ has declared and what we accept, but also of development. And so the issue then is, how do we understand this development? Because clearly, Father Peter is understanding St. Maximilian, and he understood himself to be affirming that there is a fundamental foundation and unity in the cause of Mary, both in herself and who she is, who the Immaculate Conception is, but also with respect to the cause and mission and ideal of the Franciscan order. There's something that is primordial with the beginning, rooted absolutely in St. Francis, but a deepening and a development of what St. Francis understood in terms of Mary as spouse of the Holy Spirit, Mary as when he declares in the world, there is no other woman like you, Mary. The uniqueness of Mary in relationship to her Lord, in relationship to the rebuilding of the church, and in relationship to the mission of the Franciscan order, the cause of the Franciscan order being essentially Marian. This is something that is, is, is occurring, and there's a development of doctrine within and between St. Francis on the one hand and St. Maximilian on the other, but yet there's an identity or unity. So how do we understand the principle of development as in distinction within a more fundamental identity of life, a, a more fundamental continuum or continuity of a way of life. And this is what uh, <clears throat> has to be addressed. So what are some of the assumptions then of dogmatic theology? We've already touched upon this and we'll run through these quickly. There's a real subject of inquiry located in the reality of the church and its teaching. Second, there are, re there are sources by which the, the faithful or believers access these teachings. There are sources. These are called what positive theology calls the sources of theology or the loci theologicis. <clears throat> and then there are certain rules. So you have the subject, which is the church. You have the sources, what the church uh, has declared and manifested, and the resources that believers have to, or as witnesses or monuments to what the church has already believed. And then there are certain rules and constraints built into how we uh, pursue dogmatic theology. And all of these pertain directly to what Father Peter is doing in the Theolo Theologian of Auschwitz. First of all, we must be, with respect to rules and constraints, first of all, we must be believers and learners, receiving the magisterial teachings of Christ through the mediation of his appointed teachers. But however, on the other hand, there are limits in terms of accessing this teaching. There are epistemic limits. Obviously, we can't know what we don't know. And there are certain limitations to those uh, areas of knowledge, you know, whether linguistic, whether historical, um, that sort of thing, whether even aptitudinal, uh, certain things we just won't be able to figure out. So there are uh, epistemic limitations, meaning <clears throat> we don't um, 
have access in a knowing way to some of these things, or our access is controlled by the sources which are limited, uh, by sources which, which, which can be um, even biased in their presentation. For example, a great, the great history of the church uh, in the, during the patristic era was uh, from Eusebius, but Eusebius was clearly uh, sympathetic to the uh, Arian side of the debate. Nevertheless, he's an absolutely essential source. Um, and so there are epistemic limits with respect. There are historical limits. Well, the most obvious one is we're not living in the time of uh, Christ and the apostles and the first generation. So there's going to be a uh, distinction and that space in between then and now is going to be filled up with all sorts of events and developments, vicissitudes, changes in the life and experience of, of the church and of believers and how we understand those initial sources like scripture, like the early liturgies. So there are historical limitations. And thus, if there's an a priori of accepting the teaching and understanding the teaching of Christ on the basis of his authority and the authoritative teaching of his successors and their successors, there's also going to be an a posteriori method, meaning a priori is what comes before. We must accept these conditions in order to enter into the inquiry of dogmatic theology. But having once accepted these conditions, there also are a posteriori, these things which come after. So once we accept the conditions, we have to then apply these conditions to the very resources and sources we are looking at and analyzing in faith and in fidelity to the continuous tra tradition and worship of the church. So if there, if there are limitations of accessing the teaching of the church in terms of dogmatic theology, there must be a posteriori methods, methods that come after this acceptance that allows us to better analyze, collate, and um, apply and extend the teachings of the church as such. So what are some of the a posteriori, a posteriori conditions of dogmatic theology? First, dogmatic theology, and again, remember, this is what Father Peter is, is engaging in, is deepening the teaching, the authoritative teaching of Christ in and through and with Mary as given to the apostles and preserved and actuated in the teaching of the church, the perennial magisterial teaching of the church, as well as continued and applied and lived in the church's liturgical worship, especially the, the um, Eucharistic worship of the Mass. So first then, to get back to the point, first, dogmatic theology searches for unifying themes, traits in the teaching of the church that are sufficiently clear and public that we can reach a wide consensus, excuse me, of, among theologians. And this then implies that the formulation and use of methods that will also be agreeable to believing theologians. So there's going to have to be, um, in terms of method, there's going to have to be something that allows us to recognize common points of discussion, areas of convergence, conformity, overlap between different approaches, different, different ways of answering and deepening uh, what the church already has authoritatively declared and what the church believes. So if there's themes and traits that are able to be recognized, as the belief of the church, theologians can recognize those too. And then say this is in, 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 in large measure what dogmatic theology is trying to understand better and deepen. And so this will imply then if there are common truths, common themes, there will be methods that will also be not absolutely opposed or disparate from one another. So that's the, that's the positive. However, no set of methods, namely theological methods, which use philosophy, history, science, all of these disciplines in order to aid itself. Remember, theology is, is the queen of the sciences and philosophy, which includes in the Middle Ages, basically every other discipline, except for perhaps medicine and law, every other discipline. Theology is the handmaid of the science. Theology is going to use all of these disciplines. Why? Because we've already said it's faith seeking understanding and understanding is something that is given to us as a natural faculty and must use natural tools and means already presupposing though, the context of faith and the gift of the spirit. So there's this synergy that's going on with 
where we're working, who we're working with in the context of the church and the mission of the spirit. Nevertheless, it's still us and our minds working with this data that we already believe and accept and want to live. <clears throat> so we're going to have to use methods, but no set of methods or criteria in fact, in reality, have achieved an absolute and universal consensus among dogmatic theologians. So this is where people will tend to disagree. But the point here is, is if it's admitted that no particular method or set of method or criteria have been universally accepted or achieved universal consensus, there's a great deal of freedom with the various methods that we use in terms of organizing um, our, our theological reflections, there's a great deal of freedom. And so basically what we're trying to do is establish the best, best method, a method that preserves the, the, in a sense, the charter of the teaching of scripture and the early fathers, yet able to integrate what's come subsequently. So method will try to do the best with the data that it has in a manner that is a faithful to the acceptance of the faith declared by Jesus and his successors in continuity or in harmony with the, the greater witness of tradition, while at the same time maintaining an openness and engagement with new facts and new ways of pursuing um, various inquiries in the modern era. So here, this is, this is where no dogmatic theologian is going to be um, the final word in and of himself. But remember, we've already stated that theology is ultimately rooted in an acceptance of the authority of Christ. So dogmatic theolo theologians help the church and deepen the church's reflection. But no conclusion of a dogmatic theologian is binding just simply because that dogmatic theologian thinks it follows inexorably from the logic according to the method of the premises which he's established, even if they're revealed premises. No, the conclusion is something that is only given the assent of faith if the authority of Christ through his successors says this is a faith. So there's, there's, there, there's a great deal of freedom in terms of method. The method just simply can't violate reason or can't violate the faith. And some methods are clearly going to be better than others. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, and no dogmatic theologian, his conclusion is going to be binding on the faithful apart from the authoritative recognition and imposition or declaration of those who speak in the name of Christ that this conclusion of a dogmatic theologian is such the case. A, a classic example is uh, Scotus's defense of the Immaculate Conception. And here we have um, with St. Maximilian and what Father Peter is doing, we have another instance where this seems to be a valid conclusion of dogmatic theology according to sound method which takes into account the history of dogma, the development of the church, the historical record we have on hand, but nevertheless is not binding upon the faithful until and um, <clears throat> until and and in such an event that the church declares it binding. Now, this is different than what personal faith might require of the individual believer based upon his own conviction that this this is, this is the objective teaching of the church, and one is perfectly free and it's salutary to follow these convictions as long as they don't contradict the church, but nevertheless that, that conviction doesn't become yet universal until it's declared. Now, it may be the case that certain arguments can be presented that this has already been declared universal, but we'll get into some of these issues later on, and I, I don't want to anticipate too much. So if no set of methods or criteria have been achieved in an absolute or universal way, this implies then, going on to the fourth point, this implies that we must do our best with limited resources to formulate and apply a coherent method or set of methods when doing theology. And again, Father Peter provides us with a model and he gives insight into what he's doing. And finally, our theology, and what I mean by our theology, I'm following here, Dun Scotus and Father Peter, use this phrase a lot, and he followed Duns Scotus, that our theology is again rooted in what Christ has declared of the Father. Our theology is, our the is, is the theology that we pursue here and now in the time of pilgrimage in the context of the body of Christ. We, we can only do theology in the revealed sense um, <clears throat> on the basis of what has been 
declared by Christ. We have no access directly to the mind of the blessed or the mind of God himself. So our theology is dependent upon what's declared. So it, it, our theology then, what we do here and now, will, will remain relatively provisional. But nevertheless, it must be clear. And this is where we apply method. Um, <clears throat> now, what I mean by provisional is our theology as a dogmatic discipline will be provisional and it can be accepted or rejected or simply not dealt with by the magisterium. And so insofar as it's not dealt with, it's provisional. Insofar as, it, it's, as, as it's accepted and taught then by the magisterium, it's no longer provisional in the sense that um, there can be a going back or a turning back from it. Insofar as it's rejected by the magisterium, well, clearly it's, not, it's no longer merely provisional. It's actually to be rejected and no longer taught. <clears throat> so let's move on to the next criteria. So um, basically the criteria for our theology is understanding and using the resources that we have, the church fathers. How do we identify a church father? Um, and the church fathers, the Roman magisterium, Eastern church witnesses, as well as the fathers and doctors. Now, I don't want to go into each of these topics because these can be found uh, um, quite easily online through a, a Google search or a good uh, theological manual. But first, we must understand who the fathers are, um, how to identify a church father, and then how to identify the church fathers as witnesses or monuments of tradition in relation especially to the Roman magisterium and then subsequent developments of and, and acceptance and interaction with legitimate apostolic tradition claims of Eastern churches. And then in concert with how the fathers were, re were received and applied by later doctors of the church. So post patristic era, a father essentially is someone who taught in the early church and taught with authority, recognized oftentimes in a council, an ecumenical council, as one who spoke with authority and one who was a saint. So Tertullian origin are not considered church fathers, even though they're very important ecclesiastical writers. Why? Well, because, well, Origen was condemned by a council or at least uh, a local synod 10 or so years before a council. Uh, I'm talking about Constantinople 52. Um, <clears throat> and Tertullian ended up uh, in later life outside of the church as a Montanist uh, heretic. And so a church father is someone who is ancient in the church, who taught with authority, and who was recognized oftentimes as having authority by the church in council or by a pope, and then lived a life of sanctity. Uh, a, a doctor comes after this early period, but also has many of the same characteristics. A doctor is someone who's recognized by the authority of the church for his teaching, as well as his holiness. You know, some of the, some fathers can also be doctors, and um, <clears throat> some of the great medieval examples of doctors of the church are, of course, um, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure recognized both for their sanctity, but also for their teaching in theology. Uh, so, you know, quickly moving through, and here's, this may be review to some of you, but this is, this is important because what we will find is in approaching dogmatic theology, there are certain guides in how we see um, the interplay between what's accepted and declared and how we, um, seek further understanding. And so four key figures, and we'll look at it, we'll look at three of them, four key figures in the history of how to approach dogmatic theology uh, are Vincent of Lorenz, uh, a church father, St. John of Damascus, uh, a, a church father and a doctor of the church, uh, the Spanish Dominican Melchior Cano, who uh, basically gave us one of the first systematic treatments of what the sources of theology are. And then finally, uh, St. John Henry Newman, who began to articulate a notion of doctrinal development that uh, can be applied. And so his, his understanding of uh, the continuity, unity of tradition, as well as development within that tradition um, is what actually led him into the, the church. Let me, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Who's asleep? Any questions? 
Let's see what time it is. Nine forty-six. Okay. Mute me. So I think um, a lot of us are are muted here. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, everyone's got to unmute themselves to uh, talk. Um, well, I, I can't believe I've been talking for an hour and fifteen minutes. I don't have access to a clock when I am on screen share. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, if uh, if you I don't know if you need to I don't know how to, to notify me that you're uh, you have questions I think what what I what we probably will have to do is stop at um, Saint Vincent and finish with this and what we will do in the next slides is or the next part of this lecture is move directly into how Father Peter fits into this whole vision of dogmatic theology. So <clears throat> don't lose hope. What this, what this is, is I'm trying to set the table that Father Peter and St. Maximilian are not coming out of nowhere and crit critics who say that St. Maximilian fails in terms of doctrinal foundations on the one hand or in terms of doctrinal methodology on the other hand are simply wrong and Father Peter shows this. And this is one of the purposes of the first chapters of his book is to show that St. Maximilian has is soundly rooted in the dogmatic tradition. And so I'm trying to give an example of, or an outline of what dogmatic theology in, is in a, a, a relatively non-controversial sense that distinguishes between the, the various areas of theology and how theology functions so that we can then see how St. Maximilian and Father Peter understand St. Maximilian to be absorbing, integrating and applying these right. very traditional um, approaches to dogmatic questions and what sure. must be accepted. So, uh, hopefully, I'm not uh, I'm not just simply beating a dead horse or causing everyone to go go to sleep. But I think these th this is a, is foundational to understanding where Father Peter is coming from. I think it's very important as far as um, presenting why, why um, again these very points you bring up that that he is. Um, um, you know, it's a good foundation to accept what he teaches. Um, so that's, that's all very helpful, uh, especially in the apologetic sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Is, uh, please feel free to jump in because we're going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to go. I have an appointment at 10 o'clock, but we've got about 12 minutes. And I think this is a fairly good uh, breaking point. Okay. I just had one question if no one else does. Um, that the you talk about the return to Christ, the recreation, and the recapitulation is that all the same um, thing, just different terms for the same thing. Well, the re the return is through recreation that entails a recapitulation. So okay. the return to Christ, the return through Christ to the Father, will entail that we move from a state of Adam, on the one hand, a state of sin, to a state of filial sonship of the father and also adoptive filial sonship both to the father and to mary because the father and mary are the progenitors of the one person divine human of christ so we'll have to put on the new nature of christ so that entails a recreation but that recapit that recreation will include the fact that all of creation including ourselves born in adam fallen are recapitulated in christ why because capitulation, if that has to do with establishing the head, remember caput is the word for head or chapter in, in Latin, but caput means head. So the capitulation, the first capitulation is in Adam. Remember, Adam is the head of all creation and, and Eve was the co-head. Well, in the new creation, the recreation, there's a recapitulation, which means there's a st an establishment of a new head, namely Christ, and a co-head is Mary. I mean, his mother, Mary, and all of creation, everything that came before in this recapitulation is reestablished in a new order under a new head, moving from the status of being under the headship of Adam to being under the headship of Christ. And so this recapitulation under Christ of our old Adamic state and even Adam and the whole fallen reality from Adam will be resituated through recreation in the new head who is christ what we call recapitulation in order that in and with christ and through christ we then can return to the father corporately as his body does that make sense yes it does uh, to extent um so 
as far as the redemption is concerned, um, now with uh, Scotus, of course, he believes that um, Christ would have come without the redemption mm-hmm. if, or without the sin. Um, so um, some of this some of this involves a a a um, moving back to Christ from sin, or, or back to God from sin, uh, or verse, uh, versus some it involves. Um, just the fact yeah. that it's going to come anyways, you know, right. the, the right. incarnation right. per se. Yes. Well, you know what? I, I, I perhaps should have made clear the recap, the recreation has two components and the recapitulation that I'm speaking of under Christ includes both of these components. One, there's yeah. a re- recreation, meaning we move from fallen Adam to the new Adam. So we move from a state of enmity with God in Adam to a state of filial sonship with of the Father in and with Christ. So this is the the, the situation. A it, it requires a, a, a redemptive movement of a state of sin through the sacrifice of Christ to a state of filial sonship and friendship okay. with Christ and to the Father. So that's the one aspect of redemption. But remember, the whole purpose of creation, according to Scotus and according to Paul. Um, was that God would manifest and extend himself, declare the Father, meaning the Son would declare the Father, in all of creation. So the purpose of creation was Christ, and Christ is a divine person, and the purpose of Christ was to have a bride. So not only must there be then a redemptive recreation, a movement of enmity to friendship with the Father in and through Christ, but there also must be, and this is the, the whole the whole purpose, is not primarily redemption, but salvation and what we mean by salvation is elevation from not 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 even an adamic mode but simply a, a, a finite mode a created mode to a supernatural mode a mode that transfigures our intellect and our will such that we can love in a manner that is like the spirit who is the love of the father and the son in the trinity for eternally so there's not just a redemption a, a, a pulling us out of a state of sin a fallen state but there's an elevation to a state of salvation wherein we are are both redeemed from sin but redeemed up into saved up into recapitulated elevated into a state of proper friendship because we're now adopted brothers of the eternal son of the father and the incarnate son of the Virgin Mary, spouse of the Holy Spirit. So you, I, I thank you for pointing that out because there are really two components. The first component and the purpose of creation is elevation of all creation in Christ such that all created persons and all of creation is brought up into this is, uh, one second. Okay, sorry, I had a phone ringing. Um, so all of creation is brought up into and with Christ as uh, in, in this familial and filial relationship. So, uh, yeah, Fra Roderick, I think if, if I responded to that, there are two components now because of sin. One from sin to non-sin, and then one from non-sin ultimately up into uh, supernatural. Community. Good, that's very, that's very good. Thank you. Do you want... To make one remark slash question regarding this too, with the talking about dogmatic theology and method, we can say that the method of theology is then taking those natural modes of knowledge and using them in a, in a supernatural mode, and that there can be different ways of doing this with different methods, for example, using the study of history for analyzing scriptural texts or maybe using methods of sort of more contemporary phenomenology, but then ultimately as mirroring that progression of human knowledge where metaphysics leads us to God, that there's a certain priority to metaphysical theology, but under that and keeping in mind that that there is a we can say there's a legitimacy to, to methods that use other forms of knowledge to expound on revelation and to understand it. Well, I think I think one would have to distinguish between using uh, philosophical methods as tools for theology, 
and different ways of uh, doing theology. Because again, there's positive theology, there's biblical theology. Um, there could be systematic, what we might call constructive theology, which is kind of like dogmatic theology, but it's not. Um, so there, we have to distinguish between tools that we use that are just part and parcel of who we are as created rational agents. And we can use these tools like history, phenomenology, psychology, all of these tools in any one of these disciplines. We can use these tools within metaphysics itself, okay? So I think we have to distinguish then the tools we use in any one of these disciplines versus how we structure and organize the discipline itself. So dogmatic theology will admit of different ways of pursuing it. But each one of these ways of pursuing dogmatic theology will use these different tools, you know, more or less, uh, according to its own method. So um, there could be a, a Thomistic method, which is to say, take the same data, but presuppose that the, the, the discipline of theology, dogmatic theology, is a subalternated science to the knowledge of God and the blessed in the same way that geometry is a subalternated science to arithmetic, right? So what we're saying there is that in principle, the, the source or the foundation, the subalternating science, namely the, the, the knowledge of the blessed and, the, and of God himself, is in principle in some way accessible. And so therefore, because this is the case, as in arithmetic to geometry, the science can work out in a mode or method of strict logical deduction. So we can establish that we have premises, then we can, we, can, we can formulate any kind of deduction we want, so long as it follows logically in the model of an Aristotelian subalternated science. Well, here's where, and these are really primary, primarily different modes in terms of the two great traditions of theological method in the Catholic communion. If you have theological methods, they're divided according to, in a coherent way, Bonaventure, Scotus on the one hand, and St. Thomas on the other. <clears throat> so this is an important thing to remember. So where St. Thomas would say subalternated science and process of strict logical deduction, the Scotist and the Bonaventurian will say, and this is again, this is so, this is why Father Peter's book is so important because he's showing that St. Maximilian is Bonaventuro Scotistic. He's not Thomistic in the way he approaches these things. What Bonaventure and Scotus say, no, theology is not primarily a subalternated speculative science. It's not simply uh, a process of logical deduction, even though that is a component. It's not simply uh, a kind of calculation. Now, I don't want to reduce or minimize Thomistic uh, theological method, uh, but there, that, that, that is a key difference. What they will say, what especially Scotus will say, is that our theology, that's why he calls it our theology, is a practical science. The purpose is for making us good, as St. Bonaventure would say. And we can make all sorts of logical inferences and deductions based upon the same data as, say, the Thomistic Aristotelian approach. But the strength of our conclusions will be different. Why? Because we cannot be certain that we've grasped um, all the implications of any bit of data of revelation, revealed theology, just simply by analysis. And we simply, we also can't simply by deduction say, oh, I've deduced the, 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 the co-redemption from the data of revelation, therefore it's authoritative. No, there's a certain kind of opaqueness. And so the analysis isn't so much as in Thomism on the basis of strict logical necessity, but trying to analyze because all of reality is contingent and revealed, we don't have access to the mind of God. We're trying to analyze not just the potuit, like what's possible, because many things are possible in terms of strict logic. We're trying to analyze the decuit, what is fitting, what best manifests the loving intentions of God as he has revealed them in Christ. And so this is the importance then of a discussion of methodology, whereas the Thomists will use a lot of the same tools and have the same <clears throat> foundations they will approach the discipline differently. Whereas using the same tools and many of the same methods and points of data, the Franciscan will emphasize not primarily uh, analysis and logical deduction, but proportion, conformity, uh, what, what we might say in terms of metaphysics, exemplary causality, St. Bonaventure. Um, or we say in, in theology, 
typology, typological reasoning, seeing how types are established in the Old Testament, precisely looking forward to their fulfillment in the New Testament. But again, the New Testament is looking forward to uh, fulfillment in the eschaton. So we have these, it's, it's more of a proportional way of thinking that is guided by the actual worship and continuous teaching of the church. Now, of course, it can't be contradictory, but nevertheless, it's more difficult to say what must be the case by strict logical necessity. We can say this seems to be the most fitting. I believe it but I can't thereby make it um, binding or dogmatic as though it were a necessary inference. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? It, it, does that help clear it up? I'm just going on and yeah, on. I was, I was thinking more of along the lines of, at least in our context, where we encounter here in Rome, a significant more emphasis on phenomenological uh, or, as they say, something that's more based in, uh, um, you'll see comments about how the medievals became uh, so abstracted that they lost sight of the scriptural and relational nature, of, the scriptural and revelatory nature of theology and the relational nature of man. And so they basically just left scripture behind while engaging in arid discussions that were far from the real life of people. And so that's, I guess, so that's where I'm wondering if you can say that these sort of more phenomenological methods have a place if they acknowledge that they are phenomenological and that they cannot speak necessarily to issues of his, like historicity, for example, of, of Adam, how can you talk about the historicity of Adam if you're trying to speak to the existential situation of the people, of someone um, in their life today? Or that so that there can be a, a place for these sorts if they remember the limits of phenomenology, that you're not actually talking about what is, but you're talking about how it appears to you. Right. Um, I think I think I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, clearly, phenomenology can be used. It's just phenomenology is like perhaps uh, historical criticism. Uh, historical criticism and phenomenology is, is closer to what's really at stake is dependent in certain ways on uh, the psychological disposition and one's uh, metaphysic, met metaphysical commitments. So uh, phenomenology can't rise to the level of metaphysics because it, it deals in the realm, I th think, uh, in, in the realm of psychology, but especially the psychological declaration of what is, is real, what is metaphysics, or what we feel should be real or should be metaphysical. Um, and so I think, I think Father Peter spends a lot of time showing how uh, the dry, arid metaphysics of Bonaventure and Scotus and uh, St. Maximilian are anything but uh, impersonal. I, I'm using dry, arid um, in air quotes, I'm being a bit ironic. Um, he, he goes to great lengths to show that they're actually uh, not inconsequential. They're quite consequential and quite um, phenomenological in terms of this being relevant to the existential situation. He, there's no problem in dealing with this. Uh, in fact, he would argue that um, it is the great medievals who are the most existential in this, uh, in, in, the, in, in the way that this term is being used. And if you want to, delve more deeply into uh, this particular question, I would recommend first uh, looking into his uh, Newman and Scotus and Dialogue, because he goes a great deal into the interplay between what he calls the phenomenological mode of expression of Newman and the metaphysical approach of Scotus and Bonaventure, and how these things are really uh, kind of in the same uh, theological and philosophical world, and how they complement each other. Uh, so I would say, I would say that's a that's a caricature, and the caricature of modern scholarship, the kind of historicizing and psychologizing scholarship, is based upon I think a deep engagement with a sound metaphysics and the implication of their own assertions. Like how can you hold this consistently? How can you uphold this kind of approach consistently? Because it's it sounds like a Kantian self contradiction. As soon as you say something about uh, an, a situation in a universal mode, well, then you're saying I have insight into something that transcends the merely existential and the psychological. Well, that's one, that's a very simple 
practical kind of uh, objection. But I think another uh, important objection is that while historical criticism is important as a tool and must be recapitulated, reheaded in terms of a hermeneutic of faith, the analogy of faith, what is more important is to see the scholastic period, the scholastic doctor's engagement with the patristic mode of interpretation, which is primarily typological. And this, in, this, has, this carries with it certain metaphysical commitments, but it's a metaphysical, it's a set of metaphysical commitments that is seemingly instantiated by our Lord himself. This is how he taught. It's seemingly um, carried out and manifested in the progression of history from the creation through the, through the Exodus, through the judges, through the kings, through the prophets, and then carried over into as a way of explaining reality into the New Testament in its relation to the Old Testament. And then this is something then the church carries out. So this is manifest in scripture and in the fathers. And this is what the doctors of the church we're dealing with. This is the metaphysical interpretation of scripture, which must um, inform any historical, critical, phenomenological, existential uh, ap approach to scripture. Now, clearly there are new insights to be gained, but those insights can't violate sound metaphysics, sound theology, because sound theology and sound metaphysics, as Bonaventure says, are one and the same with our Lord. Our metaphysics is Christ. As, as Saint Bonaventure says, so that's the fundamental commitment. Um, I better I better run. I just had actually uh, Father Wayne give me a call. That's why I had to jump up. Um, but if you have if you have questions, we'll we'll continue this. We'll finish this, and we'll get through the introduction in the next lesson. The next time we meet, I've got all the notes and outlines already, and so you'll be able to see how all of this comes to bear in what Father Peter teaches and how he approaches Saint Maximilian. I'll provide more evidence for that. And uh, we'll, we'll wrap up this, this part of uh, the seminar next week and move into the following chapters the following week. So if you, if you feel so inclined, you know, read through the introduction, look at the uh, glossary, read ahead, um, and uh, check out perhaps uh, if uh, you're interested in Father, I mean, Friar Charles' question, check out Newman and Scotus and Dialogue. I'm sure you have a copy of it. It's quite, quite a worthwhile read. Um, in any case, I, I appreciate your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me, because I've, I've got to run now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goff. And just to let you know, there's a few of us here, but the camera wasn't pointing at us. So. Okay, okay. Well, it's wonderful to see you all again, and I uh, hope to see you next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. 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 Just, to, just to say, I don't think we'll be meeting, meeting next week. You're on retreat. I'm on retreat? I think so. That's what you said last week. I did say that. Okay. Yes, that's right. So the next time, the week after. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. I might have missed it. <laughs> All right. God bless. I hope you have a great week or two weeks. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you.